Hello, my name is Les Brown. This is Mamie Brown's Baby Boy, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. You know, at this particular time, I want you to, first of all, pat yourself on the back and take the time to thank yourself for becoming involved in a process for looking at your life. If there's ever time that we need to begin to stop and think and assess ourselves, that time is now. When you begin to look at the foreclosure rate that's going on in the country and the foreclosures and the bankruptcies and in addition to that the violence and people losing their jobs and the level of uncertainty and fear that people are feeling and I think there's a level of stress in the air unlike anything we've ever felt before and so just to take the time to think to pause and particularly not only looking at what's going on but asking yourself the question how's this affecting me you know, we want to all become successful, but I've found that there's some success that's toxic success. What I mean is that you don't want to win, end up going after goals and dreams and neglect yourself. I want you to think about your goals and dreams and things that you want to achieve, and at the top of the list, I want you to put up there your strategy for being here. I just came from the doctor. Let me share something with you. I don't care what goals and dreams that you have. You've got to have your health in order to be here. So at the top of my list, and I'm suggesting you put it at the top of your list, your strategy, your game plan for being here. What are you going to do to take better care of yourself? That's one of the first things I want to ask you about. Because when I look at my life at 64, and I used to think people in their 50s were old, but now that I'm 64, I said, look here, people in their 80s and 90s, they're old people. My goal is to be here not only just to see my grandchildren, but to see my great-grandchildren and my great-great-great-grandchildren. But in order to be here, that's not just lip service. That's a commitment with my time, with my energy, and the choices that I make. So I want you to think about your strategy for being here, and I want you to think about your goal, your goal for securing your life in your future. See, as I get older, my goal right now is to become an asset to my children rather than a liability, financially and physically. See, I don't want to be a burden to my children. I, I don't even know if they like me that well. <laughs> I love my mother. My goal and dream was to take care of my mother. I did that. I bought her a home. I took care of her until she's 89. But children, they're different today. These are different type of people up in here. You don't know what this generation might do. Now, I know they say, Dad, we love you, but I really, really want to stay in good shape and take care of myself because I don't want to be around the house and, and my kids say, look here, who's going to take care of me today? All he's doing is sit around talking to himself, talking about, yes, I can, and yes, I will, talk it out of his head. No, I don't want that kind of party for me. My goal and objective is to die young at an old age. So I have a game plan. I, I don't like to eat vegetables all the time, but now I feel like a silly wabbit. <laughs> Why? Because I realize at this stage of my life, I've got to eat more vegetables, I've got to get more rest, I've got to drink more juices, and I've got to do all of the things that make the healthy choices that will say to my body, Les, you plan to be here, I see that you're serious, so I'm going to take care of you. I do 160 push-ups every morning nonstop. Why? I couldn't do that at 15 or 20. But at this stage of my life, I've got to do those kinds of things in order to challenge my body, to stretch my body, and to indicate I plan to be here. What's your plan? What's your goal? Because if you don't have a goal for being here, being here is not a given. When I was a kid, we used to go to funerals of old people. I can't tell you how many young people whose funerals I've gone to. I can't tell you how many. And so, and, and there's something about between 40 and 60. I don't know what it is about that period in time. Between 40 and 60, when you, if you're approaching 40, I can tell you, and you already know, life begins to intensify. Things happen to you, and things happen to people you care about. Between 40 and 60, if you can make it through that period, whew, you can take a deep breath, because most people don't make 60. Most people don't. And why? And I think it's because people just take it for granted that they're going to be here. So I want to share with you some goals and strategies as you think about your goals. I want you to visualize yourself having optimal health, um, having your right mind. I used to ask my mama, Mama, every Sunday you stand up in church and other older members of the church say, I want to thank the Lord for waking me up in my right mind this morning. Why do you all say that all the time? She said, don't worry, son. You live long enough, you'll find out she was absolutely right. I went in the room the other day to find something. I got in there, and I couldn't remember what I was looking for. 
I came out. I remembered what I was looking for. I went back in. I found it. Then I couldn't remember why I was looking for it. One of my children said, Daddy, you need some ginkgo biloba. I said, what's that? She said, something for your memory. I went down to the health food store. I was walking around. The lady said, may I help you, sir? I said, I forgot why I'm here. <laughs> she said, you need something for your memory. I said, I know. So they took me over to a little section, and I bought the stuff, and then I took it home. Now, I can't remember where I put it. So when I got up this morning, I said, I want to thank the Lord for waking me up in my right mind this morning. See, if you woke up in your right mind this morning, that's a good thing. I called a friend of mine the other day, Miss Williams. said, Miss Williams, how you doing? She said, baby, I'm doing good. She said, I went to the bathroom by myself, not all myself. I said, too much information, too much information. Let me tell you something. But that's a good thing. I know about that. I've been in the hospital. I know what it is not to be able to move. I know what it is to have back challenges. I know what it is to be in pain. So this thing called life, you've got your health? Let me share something with you. That's a good thing. A friend of mine, Bishop T.D. Jake, said, if you got a problem man or money can solve, you ain't got no problem. I can agree with that. And I learned some things going through that experience. And really, I should say, growing through that experience. My goal at that time was to be here. And trust me, it's better to be seen than to be viewed. Are you feeling the brother? Up in here, up in here. So I want you to think about your goals and dreams. And here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to say to yourself, it's possible. It's possible. And I want you to follow along with this process. As you think about your goals and dreams, I want you to write this down. I'm going to give you some strategies of maintaining this possibility mindset. I want you to write down mindset maintenance. Mindset maintenance. Let me share something with you. The easiest thing that I do every year is to live my dream. That is helping people to realize their potential, to step into their greatness, challenging themselves, reinventing themselves, to start their own businesses. I've helped over 400 people earn millions of dollars. The easiest thing I do every year is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, going into prisons and juvenile detention centers, teaching young people mindset development, how to become effective communicators, how to dress like a prospect rather than a suspect. Those are the easy things that I do. Let me share with you the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life. And that was to believe that I could do it. That's the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my entire life. To believe that I, Les Brown, who was born in an abandoned building on a floor in a poor section of Miami, Florida, with a twin brother, we were adopted. We were six weeks of age by Mrs. Mamie Brown, and I called myself Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. All that I am and all that I ever hoped to be, I owe to my mother. I saw a sign once that said, God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. To believe that I, Les Brown, who was labeled educable mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade, fell again when I was in the eighth grade, to believe that I had the ability to live the life that I'm now living. No one could have told anybody who knew me, including myself, looking in on us when Mrs. Mamie Brown was raising us in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City in Overtown, that I would be who I am right now. I didn't even know that. And I want you to think about your goals and dreams, and I want you to expand them. Why? Because it has been said that most people fail in life not because they aim too high and miss. No, most people fail in life because they're just like I was for 14 years. They aim too low and hit. And many never aim at all, not at all. They just go through life surviving. Someone said that many people die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65. I was talking to a friend of mine named Rosia, and I said, Rosia, how are you doing? And she said, let me tell you something. Life is a mess. I said, girl, what are you talking about? She said, my life is a mess. She said, you know what? She said, I just was sitting up here thinking, I haven't lived. I haven't lived. She said, I've been working hard all my life, paying bills and taking care of my children, and my children are gone, and I've just been thinking, I haven't done anything. She said, when I die, I don't want when people view my body, I don't want them to say, oh, she had a funny expression on her face. <laughs> I said, what do you mean by that? I don't want to have an expression that I'm mad, because if I died right now, I would be mad. I said, why? What are some of the things you'd like to do? She said, travel. I would love to travel. I'd like to see the pyramids. I've never been to Paris. I want to go to Paris. I've never been there. There are things that I want to see, things I want to do. She said, I want to make a difference in young girls' lives, teenage mothers. I was a teenage mother. I want to be able to make a difference in their lives and see the impact that I had on their lives. And she learned, she, she mentioned a variety of things. 
And I, I remember a story about a lady who went to the doctor and she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she came home and she was sitting at a table and, and she was drinking some coffee and all of a sudden she, she just looked up and, and she said, I refuse to die an unlived life. I refuse to die an unlived life. And she decided that she was going to live. That up to that point her life was for her family, for her children, for her husband, but she, she had left herself out of the equation. Have you ever done that? I, I remember at a period of my life I was going to work and I was working on a job that I hated. And at the same time, I was praying that I wouldn't get fired. I was praying that I wasn't laid off. I was miserable. Nobody was holding a gun to my head, but I showed up every day and I used a flimsy excuse. Well, I got to pay the bills. I've got a car payment I have to pay. I have a family. I have children. I have a, a car note and I have a mortgage note I have to pay. I've got to survive. I was showing up for a paycheck. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not living. And a friend of mine said, you know when people change? And I said, no. He said, when they get to the point when they say, I've had it. I've had it. 